Hi friends, David here from Learn Christmas Lighting, and in our last video in this series, tutorial, playlist, whatever, we talked about kind of the basics of like RGB Christmas Lights 101 from a like non-nerdy, non-super geeky perspective, because uh, that's, you know, kind of the world I live in, and if you're the super geeky, you know, likes to code type, I have no problem with that, and that's a lot of our hobby, obviously, but it's not my angle, right? Uh, it's not where I come from. It's, I kind of blend the two worlds together here. And so today, what we want to talk about are controllers, because controllers are one of those things that you can be, say, say it's like October or November, and you're setting up your display, and you're like uploading things to controllers and playing sequences and stuff. This is like the one spot where people either go, oh, that was easy, cool. Or they're literally banging their head against the wall for hours, spending, you know, entire weekends troubleshooting, going, okay, this is not working right. Why is this funky? Why is this not right? Why, 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 why? Um, and honestly, you know, if they on the front end had listened to, to our recommendations for controllers and my recommendations here that I'm about to give, they wouldn't have these problems because I'm telling you, we do this, we work with beginners, tons of them every year in our courses individually, and we help them in our forums. Um, and it really does make a difference. There are controllers out there, like the Holiday Coral controllers, for example, that are fine. Like they do the job, but in terms of the workflow out of X lights and the ease of getting everything going and everything into them, there just is no match for the culp, the controllers we're going to recommend here, which is primarily the culps. Okay. Um, so boom, let the, let the rabbit out of the bag. We don't even sell the culp controllers at our store. I probably should get on that, but here's, here's why your controller type matters. And here's why we recommend these ones so much. And, and here's what we're going to recommend. First of all, there's a few things that come in mind when you think about a controller here in the modern day in the Christmas light hobby. In my opinion, a good modern controller should be one that you can configure easily. And we'll talk about what that looks like in a second. And that is going to be able to play back your show on that controller and save the data to that controller. Because when you do that, you then have the ability, if you want it, to run all your controllers wirelessly, okay? If you're streaming the full channel data for every light to your controllers over Wi-Fi, it's going to have problems. It's never, that's never a good solution. And so that's where, for example, I recently reviewed this RGB to go starter kit, and this has a WLED controller. There's a lot of people selling and promoting WLED controllers out there, um, especially bigger ones. And I just would urge you to have some caution there because sure, you know, I've had networking pros go, oh my goodness, I'm a network professional and I have, you know, 50 of these in my yard and they work perfect. And that's fine, but on your average home network, that's not the case. It's not going to go smoothly. It's going to have issues. Things are going to be laggy and buggy and a pain. These are fun for playing with, for setting up some stuff on your indoor tree for fun, for having an interface to work with lights. Heck, I even set this on the outside of my house for the non-Christmas times of year, and I use the built-in patterns in WLED to just do patterns that are just not musical, just, you know, just static stuff over the course of the year, and it looks awesome. But for part of your show, streaming data from X lights, I just don't recommend the WLED based controllers. And so these kits are great. They're awesome to learn. We did a review on them. You can check that out. But for a controller in your show, this is not it. Okay, so let's talk about Culp controllers. So Culp controllers run FPP within the controller. There are two other brands that are common, and there's even more other ones that also do this. So while these lights has the WB controllers that perform the same way. The only difference, as you'll see on their page here, is that if you have a non-culp controller and you want it, and it's a beagle bone based controller, and you want to run it in X lights, it's very much in your best interest to pay for a license for FPP6 and above. It's written right here. The license keys are here and they're not expensive. Okay, so once this page loads, I'll show you. It's like, you know, 30 bucks, right, for 48 outputs. So, I mean, for each plug on that controller, you know, it's less than a dollar, right? It's like even like 75 cents or something. Somebody else can do the math or JP can and stick it on the screen. You're the best JP. But, <laughs> but essentially, it's not that big of a deal. It's just, you know, you want to kind of look at, like, I love the Culp controllers. Let's see. So if we just do a quick head-to-head 
of a 48. So this is a WB 48 and I'll explain some of these terms in a minute and it's 159 bucks. Does it come with the beagle bone? It comes with the beagle bone. It comes with an SD card. So then if I go to Culp Lights and I look at a K40 or a K64, um, cause those are kind of the two similar ones. Let's see here. I'm uh, just doing this off the fly. So a K40 is going to cost you. Hope that's a pocket beagle one. I don't like pocket beagle based ones for a couple reasons. We go deeper in our courses. Where's the K64? Yeah, that one's a beagle bone one. So this one has more ports than the Wally's lights. Um, but when we get the beagle bone and the SD card, it comes out to 212. You know, if we do the 48, even though I know that's not a perfect match, or the 40. It's a little bit closer. It's going to be 182 all in, um, where this is 159. So this is 189 all in. So they're essentially about the same price. Kurt lights, same thing. They have these controllers. Their website's having a little bit of bug right now, but they essentially have a similar controller that does similar things at a similar price point. They're all good options, um, but regardless. So why do we like FPP based controllers, particularly the Culp ones? We like them for like five reasons. So the biggest is, like I said, you know, you can play your show on the actual controller and it can be completely wireless. Like back in the day, myself and everybody else in this hobby, we used to have a network cable running from inside of our house to outside of our house, or you had a computer that you like stuck in a box outside or like in a shed or something, right? Um, there's no need to do that anymore. It could just be wireless. Your show player can sit outside. There's no problem there. Um, but there's a few other things that really set these apart. So for your show to run, there's a couple things that need to happen. Basically, you need to have your controllers. You need to have one playing the show or multiple in sync with each other, which the FPP software does for you. Okay. You need to configure the controller. More on that in a second. You need the show to start on time. So the controller needs to know the time. And you need to play the music, right? To an FM transmitter, a small speaker, whatever. The Culps are unique in that a lot of the models really do all of that. Like the K16s and 32s are some of my favorites. Um, and on board, they have a battery to keep the time so that even if you shut your display down during the day and when it's not in use, which I recommend people do with like smart plugs, even if it's not on, it keeps the time. You can also do a network based time sync, which is going to work like 90% of the time. I just find like once a season, for whatever reason, the clock you're trying to sync with from our government is down and your show doesn't start. Um, it seems to happen like one day out of the season every year. Um, so having a battery is just like a little bit better. True, your battery can go bad. You should probably replace it every season if you don't leave it plugged in year round. Um, and then it has an audio output, high quality, good audio output. Okay. Those are my keys. I really like to see those on controllers. Other than that, and it's a little deeper than we'll go here. You have short range ports, which are good for about up to 25 feet. I usually say away from the controller, you can run it in wire. Okay. Any further than that, you want to have another controller or a receiver, which can be sent on these plugs here, which use regular ethernet cable, but it's not a networked signal. It's a kind of proprietary, it's not proprietary, but it's a non-networked signal going over that cable. So you go direct out of here to your device and you're off to the races. Other awesome things about these controllers and similar is like, okay, my K16 here, it has a row of fuses at the bottom that you see here, automotive type fuses. And honestly, they're fine. If you do what I do and I recommend not doing power injection, which is a little bit beyond the scope of this video, um, typically you don't blow fuses. Okay, it's typically when you do power injection, if something goes awry, a bunch of power will, will shoot down one wire and blow a fuse. These have electronic fuses, they can self reset, it's epic. And that's what a lot of the newer controllers have. Honestly though, I don't really have a dog in the fight there like, and that's a terrible, that's a terrible acronym or whatever, that's a terrible uh, metaphor. Um, but like, I don't really care because honestly, if you don't do a lot of power injection, I find most people don't blow fuses. Um, like. I've literally never even, I think I have some automotive fuses in my car, but I've never actually used them on my controllers. Like I have like one controller that's missing two fuses and that's over what, six years of shows now. Um, so, you know, take that as it will. Um, but electronic resettable ones are also totally awesome. And I also just recommend going with the B variations of the Culps with the Beagle bone and not the pocket Beagle. Um, because I found 
just with the USB wireless or wired Ethernet adapters, every once in a while, um, people will have really bad issues with them getting detected and then they can't get into their, their controller. And there's going to be a million comments below that say, well, you can do the tether method. Well, you can do this, you can do that. Well, sometimes those things really don't work for people. And if you get the beagle bone, which has an actual hardwired ethernet port on it, that's always your safety net. If you screw up like all the configuration, you can reset the software, plug it into a network and find it. And it's reliable. And what we found teaching people is it's far more reliable than any other method. So that's about all we got. Um, oh, next step in controllers real quick is what you want to do in your layout stage as you're laying things out and you're starting to play with your different models in your show. Now that you know that you can do about 25 feet of cable to each model, and then I typically say you can run anywhere from about 150 to 300 pixels in a single run, depending on what percentage you run them at, okay? Once you have those two pieces of information, you can start to take your models, and I know this, I've not covered everything here, and you can add controllers. So you'd add Ethernet for most controllers, okay? And then you just go ahead and you add the type. So for example, I'll go to Culp, and I'll do my friend, the K16 or K32, okay? And then what you're able to do is why is it mad? Give it an IP address. And then once I do that, it's not even a real IP address. I can do what's called visualize, where I can take all of my lights and I just drag them onto the controller, okay? And then I can start to see how many pixels are in each port of the controller, how I've got things wired, and then also how much power it's actually going to draw, which is really cool at the percentage I've set them at. Um, again, we're not going through all that here, but you can start to basically literally just play around in here and go, okay, you know, 150 to 300 pixels, depending on what percentage I run them at. Some people go even more at 10%, which I'm all for. You can start to drag things around and see, okay, you know, I need about this many ports and this many controllers. And then you can commit, buy some controllers and actually lay it out for real. But anywho, that kind of concludes this video on controllers, just kind of giving you guys, um, you know, the the info you need to be able to find the right controller that fits your needs. For for us right now, and this changes every year, Culps are really what we're all in for. Some people do build them ready to run, so you don't have to build them yourself, but we just have not found a better controller yet. There's just so much we love about these things, and so we and we don't even sell them. So this isn't because we can sell them and we can't sell something else. Um, it's purely just our, our recommendation. So if you like this, you'll love our courses. The Learn Christmas Lighting Academy, you can start for a dollar. We've got full courses that teach you A to Z, all this stuff. And the biggest and most important part is that myself and other lighting experts and hobbyists are all in our private forums, all doing this together. So as you have questions, as you're going through the courses and want to apply it to your own display, we're here for you. So go check that out. If you're not quite to that step, grab our free guide over at LearnChristmasLighting.com. Um, the four things I really, really, really wish I knew before I began in this hobby. It's free. Just enter your email. You'll get that sent right away. Thanks so much for watching, and we'll see you in our next video as long as you're subscribed. Bye.